Um, our subject this evening is, is Hinduism in the 21st century. Uh, it's looking at, um, well, uh, the explanation that I've, that's been written down is very extensive. I hope I cover half the subjects there. If I don't, please stand up and complain and we'll, we'll try and cover everything. But really it's looking at the relevance of Hindu culture uh, in the 21st century. Is it relevant? Is it cool? Is it uh, something that is to be aspired for? Um, we could say on one level that the evidence is contrary, that it's not uh, what's to be aspired for is money, um, and that has become the Indian norm. Um, we could say that, so economics, we've ticked the box of economics globally, uh, say we have achieved this, we're, we're doing extremely well, thank you. Um, nuclear power, nuclear armaments, yes, we've ticked the box. We are progressive and advancing. Um, democracy, we are the biggest democracy in the world, we've ticked the box. We're uh, liberal, forward-looking. Um, but uh, I would question, are these signs of success that we're taking the box for, are there any of them in any way Indian? Whose boxes are being ticked? Who has taken leadership of the process? So what part of the public agenda in India, the political agenda, the economic agenda, the social agenda, is in itself Indian? Whose remit are you following? These are relevant intellectual questions. Um, and I think that they have to be asked. And if they're not being asked, I would be very worried that here is a culture, a civilization that is older than many on the planet that is not reflecting on itself critically. I would consider that to be very unhealthy in any culture. So that means that every generation you're going to shave off a certain percentage of culture and you can say goodbye. So, so where is this process of reflection in society? How is it being nurtured? How is it being developed? Who's asking the questions? Who's standing up to answer the questions? Who's questioning the questions? A simple question uh, to question. Um, someone like me, Samgora, appears in India and asks, what is your Bible? Can anyone give me an answer? Very quick check. Bhagavad Gita. Typical answer. Thank you very much. The difficulty I have with this is that you've answered a question that is unanswerable. Who's questioned the question? You don't have a Bible. You don't have one book. It's very un-Indian to think that there is only one book, but you insist on answering the question. Not just you. Everyone answers the question because you don't want to bring a negative into the conversation. The relationship is all important. If I ask you, will you come to my program? Oh, yes. And, and you don't turn up. <laughs> How many of you have experienced that? <laughs> and, and is that rude in the Western context? That's rude. You told a lie. You said you were coming and you didn't come. What kind of a person are you? In the Indian context, it's rude to be negative in front of someone. That, that would be considered very rude. There's a different civil, there are different civilizations at, in play. But because we don't question the question, we've ended up in a situation where there's a complete lack of communication. We haven't educated anyone by saying, well, actually, we don't have a Bible. That's education. Then the person has to reframe the question. You give it over to them. Then you've created a dialogue. That's an actual dialogue, and you are one of the participants in the dialogue, and you have helped write the rules of the dialogue. And that hasn't yet happened. So has India arrived on the global stage? by saying economics, nuclear power, democracy, and many other things, that, that is not you arriving on the global stage. That is you fulfilling someone's agenda. That's very nice. But when will there be parity of esteem? When will there be a peer relationship between cultures and civilizations? And I would argue in this talk that that actually hasn't happened yet. Um, and I will begin my argument by going back in the mists of time to the Rig Veda. So I presume most of you will have heard of the Rig Veda. It's the oldest book of philosophy known to man. It is actually the first verse of the Rig Veda was um, recited, was the first recorded sound. Thomas Edison 
recorded the first verse in Oxford, um, funnily enough. Professor Max Muller uh, recited the first verse of the Rig Veda. That was the first recorded sound. They thought that was important, the oldest text be the first recorded sound. So, so just to give you, uh, people know that this is an important text. So what's in the Rig Veda? How many people have actually read it or studied it? And I would argue that the ideas of the Rig Veda, the philosophical ideas of the Rig Veda, are the essence of Indian thinking. When I say Indian thinking, I'm including Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, Indian Islam, Indian Christianity, and even Indian Judaism. So there, there is an Indian psyche. It's the way Indians think, and it comes from a very discernible philosophical basis. And I'll share with you a few words that encapsulate that philosophy. Um, and then we can see for ourselves, is Hinduism relevant? I, I would say it's not only relevant, it's alive. It's just that people don't know where it is in their thinking, in their society, in their culture, in their civilization. And, that, and that's an issue of education. That's, we can remedy that. Um, so, okay, let me ask you uh, all a question. I would like you all to raise your hands. How many of you would like to be happy? Good reaction. Raise your hands. Okay. Is there anyone that would not like to be happy? Because we can arrange that now. <laughs> okay, well, uh, so, okay. So, so you want to be happy. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. You're an Indian audience. I've done this with English people, Irish people, Dutch people, Chinese people. The response is always the same. This goes back to the Rig Veda, one of the first words of philosophy in the Rig Veda, karma. You all know what karma means. It means desire. It, it's a, a thread that runs right through the Upanishads, the Mahabharata, the Gita, the Puranas, all through Indian text, and it's deliberated over, over and over again. Desire. What is it that we want? It's a very simple question. So I've asked you what you want. You want to be happy. Okay. So let's look at the quality of the happiness you want. Hands up all of those who would like to be diseased, to suffer, to die. Again, we can arrange these things. Hands up everyone who would like these things. As I say, they're all available. No, interesting. So there's a quality to the happiness you want. You don't want it to end. You want it to go on and on and on. Now, let's look at the vocabulary of happiness. It's in every Bollywood song, every Hollywood movie, every novel that you've read, every piece of music that you hear. What is the vocabulary of happiness? If I come to the girl with the ring, in the Western context, this is what we do, and we say, will you marry me? Because I love you, I love you. What's the next word? Forever. Not for 25 years, not for 10 years. Can you imagine that? I love you for 15 years. <laughs> How far am I going to get? There's a vocabulary that's expected to link with happiness. I love you eternally, forever and ever and ever and ever. You will be my love. But we, we know this is, this is the expectation. It's a very interesting expectation that everyone on the planet has, no matter what our language, no matter what our culture. And Indian philosophers of the Rig Vedic period, we don't know who these people were, but they were asking very simple questions. And they asked this question, what do we want? In a very universal sense. It's not a religious question. It's just a very simple question. What does a child want? What does an old person want? What does a Chinese person want, an Irish person, an Indian person? It's the same answer. We want happiness and we don't want it to end. So, okay, very, very simple. The issue of karma, of desire. How do you satisfy the desire? So, profound issue, it becomes more profound when you ask the next philosophical question, which is, who are you? Very simple question. So, if I say, Sir, in the blue shirt, who are you? Can you identify yourself to me? No, nope, your neighbor. The blue shirted victim. Top of your head, give me an identity. An Indian. But you can change your nationality, can't you? 
human being, but you could reincarnate as an animal maybe. Conglomeration of thoughts. Now you're getting a bit conceptual there. <laughs> I can see you. <laughs> the issue is when we ask the simple question, who are you? That's essential in understanding how you achieve what you want. If you don't know who you are, you don't know what to satisfy. It's a very um, simple concept. In uh, Rig Vedic terms, it's called Atman, as, as we know. They have discerned that if we want happiness that goes on, there must be a part of us that has an, an existence beyond this body, an existence that has no, no beginning and has no end. It's a very simple idea. In the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna sums it up very succinctly, as the Gita is a very succinct text. Uh, beautiful poetry. Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future will any of us cease to be. So this is Upanishadic philosophy, Vedic philosophy, concisely put. This idea is a total game changer philosophically. This is what uh, makes Hinduism unique in terms of worldview. If you understand that worldview, you can understand Hinduism. So this is a... a and. Uh, the West has totally failed to understand this. When they discuss with you, they're living in a one-life scenario. The next text in the Gita, Krishna says, Dehino kumaram yovanam jara tata dehantara praptir diras tatra namuyati. So as the, bo the soul, the self, the atma, goes in this body from childhood to youth to old age, similarly it goes into another body at death. So the idea of reincarnation. What Krishna has said in this, after death, it, it travels on because it has an eternal existence. It's eternal energy. It's not material. But he has also said that in this lifetime, from childhood to youth to old age, it is also reincarnating because every seven years, every cell in our body changes. So we have reincarnated in this lifetime. I remember my seven-year-old body when I fell over the handlebars of my bicycle and broke my two front teeth. And I have front teeth now. So my, my body has changed. And we all remember being a child and being in that body. And now we're in this body, which is totally transformed. But I remember being seven. Who is the I? That's Krishna's point. This is the Atma. This is who you are. This is the self that needs to be satisfied. And unless you satisfy this self, then how can you be happy? This is a very uh, profound philosophy. So, and it... And it, it infects, shall we say, how everyone in India thinks. Everyone is aware of the issue of desire. Everyone is aware of the concept of Atma. And we'll add another word, Sat. You'll all have heard of Sat. It is often translated as truth, but um, is maybe more properly translated into English as, as real. What is real? Which is maybe more profound than just simply truth. So what is real and what is unreal? So how, to, how do you distinguish both? Um, the idea of sattva comes from this. Sattva is a very profound idea in Indian thought. Um, everybody in the Indian context is trying to excel, trying to do the best thing, the most pure thing, the right thing. There's all this, all this looking up, trying to um, elevate ourselves. Um, and that comes from this idea of sat. It also refers to the necessity that we have to find meaning and purpose. When we walk into a room, we want to know exactly what's going on. We need to know. There's a need within us, every one of us. Again, it's not an Indian thing. It's not, not a sectarian thing. As an Irish person, I have exactly the same uh, urge within me to find out what is real, what is actually happening. And on that basis, you can develop trust. You can understand. You can be peaceful. Um, and the next idea, the next word is ritta. Ritta is maybe a word you haven't heard so much of. It hasn't been examined academically anywhere. <clears throat> and it's not used very much these days, but it is one of the most profound philosophical concepts in Indian thought. From ritta comes the idea of dharma, ahimsa, um, seva, varnashram, uh, purusharta, karma, and reincarnation. So it's 
it is good to know where these ideas come from because then you understand the context in which they can be used and you also understand the context in which they will be misused. Um, Ritta is a very simple term. These thinkers uh, of old just realized by staring at the sky practically that there is tremendous order in this world. Ritta is not a spiritual concept like Atma is. It's more looking at the material context. We live in a very highly organized system. Uh, from a, an acorn, you get an oak tree. You don't get a beech tree or a banyan tree or a peepal tree. You get an oak tree. That's highly organized. The traffic system of the stars, if one planet goes out of alignment one kilometer, the whole, everything just starts to bump into each other. That requires tremendous thought and careful consideration. We have a traffic system in Bangalore, I understand, that has been developed by tremendous thought and consideration and intelligence, and it doesn't even work, possibly. So how has this developed in such an organized way? So there is a, oh, listen to that. We have a, we have a culprit. So if everyone could remember to put their thing on silent. Uh, you, will, you will contribute to the cosmic order that I'm talking about. That's what Ritta means. It means cosmic order. How do you maintain this order? So if we are born into a system that is so well organized, we're born into it and we will leave it and it will continue to be the same system. So we're a very small cog in a very big machine. This is the thinking behind it. Philosophically, that leads to many conclusions. One is that we are a servant first. And you see this reflected in many aspects of Indian society. The issue of respect within families, for instance. Respect is this oil that, that just keeps this system going. So you're immediately, you're a giver first instead of a taker. If you want to achieve something, you first have to give. The idea of yagya, which comes right from the Vedas. Um, Eastern concept in the Abrahamic idea um, in the book of Genesis, God gave everything and gave dominion to man. So man starts as a master. These are two very different philosophical starting points. So Western uh, science has uncritically taken this um, uh, kind of Abrahamic beginning to continue to think we can conquer disease, we can conquer death, we, you know, we can uh, achieve all these things because we are the master rather than being the servant working with nature working as part of a system as part of a holistic system the, um, I met a lovely girl called Ritu here Ritu is a word that comes from Ritta it's also a philosophical concept as you know it means seasons it also means cycles that everything works in cycles it's a very simple idea but we, we forget it uh, all the economists forgot it in 2008, 2007, 2006. They just thought gain, 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 gain. The world just doesn't work like that. You go up and you go down. You go up and you go down. Little happiness, little distress. You don't get too bothered about the distress because there's going to be happiness. You don't get too attached to the happiness because there's going to be distress. That's just how the world works. If you understand how the world works, that's, it's a simple philosophical idea, but very profound. If you want to get something, you have to give something. It has to be part of the transaction. Now, the modern approach is, no, you just, you just take, 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 take. That becomes very selfish, very self-centered. This has, uh, it has all kinds of ramifications, this idea of uh, this idea of being a servant, finding your place as this cog in the bigger machine. That's the whole experiment of Dharma. How do you find the right thing to do? And every individual has to find their own place. This leads to a tremendous idea of pluralism. It doesn't exist in Western philosophy in the same way. In fact, uh, Voltaire, the French philosopher, used uh, the example of Indians. Uh, he said that how they approach uh, spirituality and religion, he was preaching to the churches. He was establishing the enlightenment that established the scientific year that we know today. He said, uh, you, we have to look to India, how they approach their pluralism, how they're so liberal towards anyone can practice any religion, and their nonviolence, their practice of ahimsa. These have been since the time of Pythagoras, through um, Alexander the Great, through Marco Polo. These have been the most impressive parts of Indian tradition to hit the Western uh, psyche. The pluralism, 
and ahimsa, and they come directly from this concept of ritta, these two concepts, ritta and atma. So ritta in terms of the fact that we all have to identify ourselves in terms of our dharma. I can't tell you what religion you are, you have to tell me. I can't tell you what your practice is, you have to tell me. Um, in, and in terms of atma, I realize that if everyone is an individual spiritual spark, when we say namaste, we're addressing that spiritual spark. If everyone is that, every living being, every living thing, then the tradition is not only it's being a man or a woman isn't an issue because you're a spiritual spark. Being a Irish or Indian is not an issue because we're spiritual sparks, equal. But also being an animal or being a human, we're not, we're not speciesist. Not only not racist, but not speciesist. Being black or white, being lighter skin or darker skin, Atma militates against all of that. That's a very radical pluralism. That makes feminism look like a very silly argument. It makes nationalism look absolutely redundant. To marry nationalism with Hindu culture, that's an oxymoron. That doesn't, doesn't make any sense in light of this philosophical idea. That is one of the main ideas in Hindu thought. So if, if it's understood and practiced and uh, elaborated upon, this could actually uh, help the world in a very profound way. This is an export that India has to offer, this idea of pluralism. The West has been trying to access it for thousands of years. Uh, what is India doing to export it? Now, there is a $450 billion yoga business in North America. It doesn't address these issues. It's just women in leotards doing exercises. It, it doesn't represent Hindu culture, Indian culture, Vedic culture, whatever, whatever words we want to put on it. It doesn't represent this profound thinking. It's a very, very much a sideline issue. Yet it's making $450 billion. What if you could package pluralism? <laughs> Maybe we should give it to the Gujaratis. They could do something with it. <laughs> So these, these ideas, they're, they're relatively simple ideas, but they have a profound effect on how you act in the world, how you approach the world. Pluralism is not the norm internationally. Um, ahimsa is not the norm internationally. It's becoming not the norm in India. Yet look at the um, effect that Gandhi used with, with, now Gandhi is in Indian terms a controversial character. My father said of Gandhi when I was a child, he was a saint among politicians and a politician among saints, which interesting context. But in the West, he's highly respected. Martin Luther King was a Gandhian. Albert Einstein was a Gandhian. Aung San Suu Kyi is a Gandhian. Nelson Mandela is a Gandhian. Mandela and Martin Luther King, they're, they're, they're the two pictures in the Oval Office of the White House, which means Barack Obama has to salute Gandhi every day. That's, that's just a fact. He's become an icon. And why? Because of his use of satya and ahimsa. These are two Vedic concepts. So, you know, he, he packaged them in such a way that he could use them in a political sphere. Now, interestingly, let's follow this on a little bit, because we say, well, Gandhi's dead and gone, etc. But he is one of the most influential political leaders in the last hundred years. And we could say, well, what about Hitler and, and Mussolini and Stalin and Mao Zedong? Who follows them? Yet there's so many people are following Mahatma Gandhi. Maybe two of the most uh, important secular icons of the political world, Aung San Suu Kyi and Nelson Mandela, they, they attribute their political philosophy to Gandhi. That's, that's quite profound. So where is this thinking coming from? Aung San Suu Kyi in 1993, her followers were getting a little fed up of waiting and waiting and waiting. Now, as we know, it took another 20 years of waiting before any, anything happened in Burma. But she asked, um, because they, were, they wanted to do something, and that usually means militancy, and she didn't want that. So she asked Professor Eric Sharp of the um, Albert Einstein Institute in Harvard University to write a book that would explain the Gandhian principles to her followers. It had to be very simple English that it could be translated easily. So he wrote a book from dictatorship to democracy. It had the effect. Um, and it was a blueprint. How do you bring about change in a nonviolent way? How do you sideline militancy when you notice it? Very, uh, very good instructions. This book went to and, and was banned all over the Middle East. 
It particularly took hold in Tunisia, Egypt, Bahrain, and Yemen. And we had what we call the Middle Eastern Spring. Interesting, the influence of these principles in a political situation where nobody has come up with a foreign policy that has had any influence on the Middle East. Yet Mahatma Gandhi's thinking through Harvard University, through Burma, has had this influence. Now, one thing we can't do is go to the Middle East and say, by the way, thank you for applying these lovely Hindu principles. That would be the end of that. <laughs> because they're not essentially Hindu principles, they're universal principles. This is just good thinking. And it's not sectarian, it's not political, it's just good thinking to share with the world. So who has the heart to be able to um, give this good thinking in a, a liberal way? I'll take it a, a stage further. Um, India is very uh, proud of its secularism. And that's very nice. It's a concept that philosophically kind of started in Oxford with John Locke, an uh, English philosopher. And he had a problem because the Christian churches of the time were very dogmatic and doctrinaire. And to be an intellectual was very difficult. To think freely, to critically analyze was very difficult. So he developed the idea of public and private space. He thought, and this, this was at the time a neat solution. So we developed from that the philosophy of secularism. Great, fantastic. Um, it's taken hold in India at, at the time of independence. A secular idea was, was adopted. Then that means you teach no, um, nothing religious in your educational system because this is secular. You could have taught all religious things in your educational system, which could have been more Indian. So, but anyway, you, you chose this. But in choosing this, and I would say I wouldn't only include India in this analysis, just the way secularism has developed internationally. Looking at it from the perspective of Ritta, for instance. Ritta means holistic. You look at the whole cosmos. Um, and this is the Indian philosophical approach. It's a holistic philosophical approach. If you want to understand a person, you look at the whole person. If you want to understand an institution, you look at the whole institution, not just one department, not one department head, not one team, the whole thing, and you get, you get the heartbeat. In Western philosophical thought, uh, we follow Aristotle, a Greek philosopher, who kind of put everything into compartments. He took everything apart and said, you want to understand a problem and there's cancer in the liver, then look at the liver, take it out, chuk -chuk -chuk, put it back. Indian philosophy would argue that, well, the liver isn't separate from everything else. Yes, you should understand all the constituent parts, but you have to understand their interdependence and interaction, because that's how the cosmos works, has this cosmic consciousness and we're all part we all have to contribute to the greater whole not that we become individuals independent of the greater whole which is how western philosophy has developed so in western philosophy to be an individual is extremely important people are striving to be an individual in eastern philosophy with the idea of atma you are an individual striving to make a contribution philosophically very different that means that the idea of just an analysis of Indian literature, there's no mention of human rights. So does that mean Indian thinkers were backward? They weren't liberal, they weren't forward thinking. Why, why do they not mention the rights of others? We don't, we're selfish, we don't think like, no, not the case. The whole argument is how to be a right human. It's an axiomatically different way of thinking. So you're not thinking about my human rights. That means all of you have to serve me to satisfy my human rights. Rather, in trying to be a right human, in finding my place in the system, I have to serve you. And if you all thought like that, then I would have a whole room of people serving me. My needs are fully satisfied. I don't have any problem. I just have to make sure I maintain my service to you. This is a very different way of thinking. One creates community, one fractures community. So the, America, as we know, is very litigious based on this thinking. In England and Europe is becoming similarly litigious. It's becoming very difficult for a doctor, for instance, to practice his art. Because if he makes one mistake, and everyone makes mistakes, then we look to him and say, it's your fault. And is that the case? in a philosophical system where you realize that there's karma at play also? It's not another person. If you point at someone, there's three fingers pointing back at you. 
Whose fault is it? That's, that's an irrelevant question. I still have to make my contribution, not to detract from this person's contribution. He may be more qualified to make a contribution than me. He, he trips up, I pick him up, dust him down, let him go on. I don't crucify him. The very different ways of thinking leading to a society that you want to live in or a society you don't want to live in. These are philosophical choices. If you don't have the choice, you can't make it. So it's important that the choice is given. So this is where Vedic philosophy becomes very practical. In looking at the holistic, again, let's look at the, go back to the um, secular uh, idea. If in the secular idea we take philosophy and religion and conviction out of the equation, because it could be difficult, that's fine. How then do you vote for a politician? Because you you never understand who the real person is. George Bush and Tony Blair both admitted after leaving office that their decision to go to war in Iraq was made um, influenced by their Christianity. That that's unaccountable for in the political system. We can't account for it because we don't ask them to account for it. There's no transparency. So how do we vote for someone if they are a committed Muslim or Christian or Hindu or Jew or atheist or whatever they are, if they don't declare it? So they've airbrushed that out. How can you trust them? We've, have we created a political system where you can't trust politicians? It's already difficult enough. But you actually can't trust them. I would go a stage further. If we create a system like that where in the workplace you can't bring your uh, conviction are you then not bringing possibly the most passionate part of you, the most creative and committed part of you, to work? So any accountant will understand that you will have difficulty accounting for the amount of energy that is not coming to work, the amount of dynamism, the amount of entrepreneurship, the amount of commitment to the process that we're debarring from coming to work. And further, I would question, is it actually democratic not to allow people to express themselves in every context? These are common sense challenges, intellectual challenges, that are made from the Rig Veda into, in this system. On a stage further, has India previously had a secular system? Has that been researched? Has it been juxtaposed against the Western idea of secularism, and is there a difference? Without doing the research, you don't know. You're not giving people choice. And that's kind of not fair, even, to create a system without thinking about it. It's very un-Indian not to think about it. All religious systems, all theological ideas in India are all based on philosophy. None of the Western ideas are. Their theologies, their faiths, looking for philosophy. Hence, they tend towards extremism and fanaticism if they don't get philosophy. Christianity has adopted Aristotle's philosophy on the whole. Islam is struggling. And Judaism is a family-centered uh, process. They, they have their own internal way of thinking. But they're not looking for another philosophy. But all Indian traditions have a self-reflective, self-critical process. There are no sacred cows in Indian uh, religious traditions because of this marriage of religion and philosophy. According to the Ritta system, you can't take them apart. You can't separate thinking and feeling. That's just nonsense. Yet in the modern system, we've separated religion and science. It would be considered by Indian philosophical standards totally um, unacceptable that you could even attempt to do that because it's unnatural. We don't, we don't live life like that. If I ask you how you make decisions, you'll answer, I look at the data, I make a rational choice based on blah de, blah de, blah and I, I will answer that you don't make decisions like that. The most important decisions we make in our lives, what, what marriage will be one. You don't make a decision who to get married on rational thought. Hands up all of those who made the decision on rational thought. You know, you, you took out a checklist. Here are the reasons to get married, a joint bank account, there's a good idea. You know, children, they'll keep me up all night for a year at least. There's a good idea. It's, rationally, no one would get married. 
You just live in sin. You pay for it or something, I don't know. But you wouldn't get married. It doesn't make any sense. It's an idea that comes from somewhere else. So how do we make decisions? If you're, if you're in a, a place and you see a beautiful girl or a handsome boy across the floor and feelings start, then you become rational. Then you think, okay, how do I achieve the goal? But the impetus doesn't come from there. The impetus comes from karma, desire. Going back again to the Rig Veda, simple philosophy. Every advertising agent knows this. They're bargaining on this fact. They know Rig Vedic philosophy. They've got it down. They'll sell you chocolate with beautiful women involved. It's chocolate. They sell you cars, beautiful women. I've bought many cars. I've never got a free woman. <laughs> but they're playing on my desire. They're saying, you desire this lifetime, James Bond, all this kind of stuff. That they understand. It's about desire. You, you, you um, agitate the person's desire enough, and they will get involved. We all understand this. It happens to us every single day. You're walking past a shop window, and you see a thing. I don't know what it is. It's a pair of shoes or it's an iPad or something and you just go, oh, the thing, the thing that will make me happy in our search to be happy. This will make me happy. These shoes will make me happy. And then you start to think, how do I do it? I can't tell my husband, number one. I can't tell my wife, iPad, too expensive, but I will get it. Ha ha ha. And we, we desire drives us very dynamic. It's uh, uh, again in the Gita, in the Upanishads, in the Puranas, it's explained this dynamic that we can all relate to. It's so simple, yet it's actually so difficult to deal with. So difficult to actually uh, wrestle with. That, um, in the Gita it says, by contemplation of the objects of the senses, one develops attachment for them. So the window, the shoes, the iPad, you develop attachment within seconds. The attachment is there. From attachment, Lust develops, karma, the desire starts to manifest. You're starting to think, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. From desire, anger arises because we often get frustrated. We can't get the thing we want. And once you get angry, it's just a downward slope. And this anger, this bitterness, this resentment can actually be very cumulative. It can just be little things. Not real anger, it doesn't manifest, but it builds up till we become at the age of 40, 50, grumpy, angry, bitter, frustrated, and it comes out in relationships in all kinds of crazy ways. Just a simple idea of desire, learning how to deal with it properly. Simple thing. Everyone on the planet is trying to deal with this. India has been dealing with this for, for thousands of years. I get, um, I'm a the chaplain at Hindu University, uh, in Hindu University, Oxford University, and I get young Hindus and, and Jains and others come to me uh, just to talk, and um, a surprising number come to talk to me about detachment, and they would come and say, I, I, I'd like to talk about detachment, and I say, what do you mean detachment? And then after talking to them for a while, I find out that a boyfriend or girlfriend has broken up with them. So they want to talk about it, they want to get over the pain, and they understand that detachment is a way of doing this. What, a, what a, a kind of a healthy young people that they have an idea of how to get over it, but they don't have an idea of how to, fall, how to stop falling into it. Um, so they, that's karma and ritta. Atma is um, much more profound in its influence, in its effect, in its challenge. Atma means, and Sankaracharya and Ramanujacharya and Madhavacharya, all the great acharyas agree on this interpretation of this, the first text of teaching of the Gita. Never was there a time when it did not exist, nor in the future will we ever cease to be. That means Krishna is saying to Arjuna, in this context, Krishna is God, Bhagavad Gita, Song of God. He's saying to Arjuna, I did not create you, that you were eternally existing. This is a total theological game changer in conversation with the Abrahamic traditions. And you have to understand how profound that is. They're quite convinced that God is a creator God. In the Indian context, he's not a creator God that we exist eternally. Now this, as a philosophical idea, is quite profound, but let's take it one step further. Christianity is a, is a uh, philosophy of love of God, how to develop love for God. 
So before Christianity existed in the Bhagavad Gita, in this text, because the Bhagavad Gita is a bhakti text. So at the end, Krishna in the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita constantly says to Arjuna, Priyostime, Priyostime, because you are dear, because I love you. So he introduces this idea. But he introduces it based on Vedanta philosophy. It's not separate from philosophy, unlike the Christian idea. Um, because, because Krishna says to Arjuna, you have an eternal existence. I did not create you. Arjuna is not beholden to Krishna. He doesn't have to love him. He doesn't have to. He has no obligation like you do to a father. God is not a father God to him. You have to worship your father. You have to respect him, even if you don't like him, even if you can't stand him, but you have to show respect. That's the proper, the proper way of the cosmic order. You have to show your children that this is the right thing to do. But Arjuna has no obligation to love Krishna, to have any, any because Krishna has given him that philosophical freedom. That's tremendously different from the Christian idea. And at the end of the Gita, he says, deliberate on this fully, all the ideas he's given, and do what you wish to do. Very non-dogmatic. Very consistent with Upanishadic and Vedic thought. So this consistency runs throughout the whole tradition. So in this idea, Krishna has begun to define love in a completely different way. Love has to be without any uh, motivation or any interruption. And he gives that basis to Arjuna. Now, in an Abrahamic idea, he's God. Arjuna has a problem. He just says, here's the solution, do it. But he doesn't do that. He leaves the choice to Arjuna. He invites him into a relationship that you have to choose. Otherwise, it's not philosophically sustainable. It's not sustainable according to Ritta. It's not sustainable according to Atma. So the individual has eternal choice. That's all we have. And by giving him that choice, Arjuna can love. Otherwise, it's not love. It's, it's obligation. It's compulsion. This is a very profound idea. Love is something that is freely given absolutely freely given. So is this a challenge to the Christ, in Christian dialogue? Could the challenge also be that Christianity on the whole has accepted Aristotle as a philosophical basis? Could it accept Vedanta philosophy as a philosophical basis, as many Indian traditions have done, many divergent Indian traditions? Now we're talking about a peer relationship. Now we're talking about parity of esteem. Now we're talking about an actual dialogue. So who's going to bring this out and show it. So is Hinduism alive in the 21st century? Yes, it's alive, not yet kicking. It'll start kicking when Hindus start to use their feet. When you get up off your asan and start to study this tradition, start to understand it for yourselves in global terms, because that's what's ahead of us in the 21st century. What is, what is your thought process, your philosophies, your theologies, your practices in global terms? How do you explain them? How do you bring them to a broader audience? How do you explain them to yourselves? Is there a Hindu hymn sheet or is it just discordant? And I don't think it's discordant. I think all Indian traditions are discernibly coming from these philosophical concepts and others. I'm just giving a snapshot. But I think Hinduism has a tremendous future if people take it seriously and begin to educate themselves and others. And I think the strategy for the future is exactly that, education. It has always been the strategy in Indian culture. The, the most valuable secular qualities, uh, virtues in Indian culture always have been vidya and vairagya. In the modern context, it's not vairagya, it's Viagra. <laughs> and and that, that can change. And what it does is, by education, you give people choice. Young people in India today or in the diaspora don't have choice. They're bombarded with the media, and they're, they're learning everything from the television, from Wikipedia, from Google, from YouTube. That, that, that's their guru, the one-eyed one guru screen. That's their guru. That's where they're learning everything. That's where they're getting their education. They don't have choice because they have no access to Hindu studies or Indian philosophical studies. It's not in the educational system. Therefore, in their mind, it's not valuable. Why should they bother with it when they can easily pick up engineering, computers, medicine, etc.? So 
we've created this society, we can create a balance to it as well. And that's, that's the necessity for the future. It needs to be a focus on vidya. And vidya isn't just secular knowledge. It has to be more than that to be holistic, to be the full picture. You can't educate someone just to maintain their body when you're going to ignore the most significant part of them, the part that is life itself. That's actually cruel. That's himsa. That's, again, contrary to Indian thought. Doesn't make any sense. We don't want to be cruel people, but we've created a system that could be essentially cruel. That has to be questioned. So by giving people actual knowledge, comprehensive knowledge, and I know the thing is, well, where is the comprehensive knowledge? Find it. it you, you have the best texts of this in the world. I'm an Irish man saying this. I should be saying the Irish texts are the best. But I don't. I find it here. I honestly have to say, Indian thinking is the best I've come across. Uh, I'm proud of it, and I'm not even Indian. But you can't be proud of it if you don't know it. And at least give other people access to it. So that would be a basic message from this evening. Hinduism in the 21st century is alive. It's vibrant. It, just, it, has, it can be now made more articulate, more uh, uh, academic, more systematic, more structured, more critical as it should be. Hinduism has no problem being critically analyzed, no problem any question being asked. Every, every question should be asked. Young people's questions should be answered, but they can't be answered unless we have teachers who know the answers. And we have some sampradayas and mats doing very, very good work, but you need to add an academic element to it that's very reasonable and very rational and extremely broad-minded. That's what's going to satisfy the desires. So this complements education that's already going on in other institutions. So that's it. with that, I would like to, with Malvika's permission, open the floor to uh, questions and answers and debates and vicious assaults. Maybe a bit more than that. But in its etymological uh, origins, yeah, we could say a term yeah. used by those from outside to describe those living in the subcontinent. Okay. You would agree? Uh, somewhat. Not? <laughs> not, not really, but okay. I can discuss that. <laughs> okay. um, in the teachings of Sri Aurobindo, uh, he objects to the term. Uh, he would prefer the use of the word Sanatana Dharma. Yeah. Uh, you, well, Comment, please. Like, yeah, um, yes, Aurobindo, among others, would like uh, the word Sanatan Dharma or Vaidika Dharma. There's so many words we can use that are Indian self-identity. Uh, Hindu, as you said, uh, um, it, it's people from Persia and, and Turkey coming to the Indus River and not being able to pronounce it properly, so it becomes Hind. Uh, yes, that's the derivation of the term. So it's a, it's a, f a foreign word anyway. It was first used in Indian literature in the 15th and 16th century, only when uh, Indians identified themselves to Muslims. So it would only ever be used in the context of Muslims. That's the only time you would say you're a Hindu. But among themselves, Indians never self-identified like that. Hinduism is a much more recent term invented by the British. It means absolutely nothing. There is no such thing as Hinduism. There's no one church, one philosophy, one religion. That's, that's a nonsense. Um, so. Indians should jettison that term as much as possible. Um, so Hindu has become, for whatever reason, the term that is internationally used and recognized, even more so, in fact, in the last 30 years. Um, I, I, use, I wear Hindu very lightly. Um, I don't necessarily identify as being a Hindu or a Christian or Irish, if the Atma thing is correct. So it's kind of semantics. So I'll use Hindu if that's what's in the zeitgeist. And if something develops more, I'm very happy with that. And it, it makes Indian culture, philosophy and religion and, and uh, aesthetics very difficult to define, actually, by not having a word that we can use, that we can all agree on. But isn't that so typically Indian? Uh, Professor? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. I want to thank you very much for your very learned and enlightening lecture. Uh, I'd like to add, Comment to my friend's uh, point. 
that Vedanta is probably even more apt description for the belief system that we have. The second question I have is, you mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita that God is a personality to be loved, not feared as in the Abrahamic tradition. But I would say that even more important is that he is your own conscience, he is a guide to sitting and that's why the symbolism of the great chariot. He is sitting there. Second point. The third, I'm very glad to hear that you believe that Hinduism has a great future. But I have a security background and hence I'm a little apprehensive of the fact that today this belief system is under attack from both outside, without, and within. And from within because of the very peculiar distorted interpretation of the word secularism. And it is combined with the other word also borrowed from the West, namely liberalism. Now, are we really convinced that with this kind of a threat, one from external sources, which believe in destroying the system as inferior and not worth preserving at all, and from inside by a distorted, politically oriented definition. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, you, you got me going now because now, now the Irishman comes out. Um, I come from a, a fighting family, maybe a Kshatriya family. We were kings and we had three castles. And uh, we were, my forebears were founders of the IRA and all this kind of thing. Well, no, no clapping for that. <laughs> um, so so it, it's something in the genes. See, I've heard these arguments so many times that you know, we're threatened. I don't see any threat. There's no threat to good thinking. No threat at all. No, nope, nothing. Nothing. It, it really is up to, you know, we can say that we're threatened by this and in, in, in England, they say the Muslims are converting our girls and marrying them and all that kind of stuff. But what are they doing to educate their girls? You know, this, to me, it's whinging. I'm sorry. It's it really, you know, um, Indian culture is strong. The, what, what are the strongest leadership qualities for me personally? Um, I look to some of the Indian acharyas. I see in them the strongest leadership qualities. These are the people that are most impressive. Who are the biggest, the most influential leaders on the planet? Jesus Christ, Buddha, Krishna, Mahatma Gandhi, people like that. What are their qualities? Humility, compassion, you know, uh, uh, practicing ahimsa. That takes tremendous courage. That takes much more courage than having a fight with someone. That's easy. That's, that's just a nonsense. You don't even have to think to do that. That's the point of it. If you start thinking, you have to stop doing that. that that's what India has been famous for for thousands of years. It stopped doing that a long time ago. Why? Because it's a nonsense that doesn't solve anything. So I, I would say that there are challenges to the external and internal threats, but you have to stand up to them and you have to challenge them at least intellectually, spiritually, by your personal example. Show them how it works. You know, I, I, don't, I don't see these as threats. I really don't. I see these as, as challenges, yes but just an opportunity to expound and say, well, have you considered this, this, and this? And in every case, I find they haven't. They haven't considered higher because they're not looking higher. They're looking down at their feet. So you just raise their chin up and they're surprised. So we can raise people's expectations, raise their thinking, raise their consciousness, raise their awareness. That, that can relatively easily be done, but you have to have the courage to do it, to stand by your convictions. And, and that's not happening. That, that to me is the issue. So Hindus have to come out not fighting. You know, Arjuna was exhibiting humility on the battlefield. He didn't want to fight. Krishna said, if you don't do it, someone's going to do it. I'm inviting you to do it. So you please do it on my behalf. He did it out of humility, out of a service attitude. So he didn't do it taking great pleasure in it or he was looking for power. He was detached from the result. That, that's courage. That's power. That's actual power. If someone's detached, they have much more power than someone's attached because you know how to get someone who's attached. 
You know how to weaken them. You don't know how to weaken someone who doesn't have anything to lose. That's very difficult. So, so I would, I recognize the issue, but I would, I would turn it around. And I say that on that basis, Hindus can begin to strategize. And they, be, they can begin to come up with intellectual arguments that, you know, we don't want to defeat secularism, we want to discuss with it as peers. And we, we don't want people to talk down or talk up or any of that nonsense. Because at the moment, sorry, the discussion in India is between Marxist Leninists on one side, one extreme, and nationalist Hindus on the other, another extreme. And it's not a sensible discussion. It's a silly discussion, quite fr in my personal opinion. I don't see sense coming out of either side. And interestingly, more interestingly for me, the Marxist-Leninist ideology is not Indian, and the nationalist Hindu nationalism is not Indian. So what, what kind of discussion are they having you know, in the name of India? It's, it's just a nonsense. No one's discussing anything that's relevant to India. I don't mind people being Marxist-Leninist in India, but they should know something about the Indian antecedents of this. What influence did Indian philosophy have on Hegel and Goethe and Schiller and, and Heidegger and all these people, which it did? The Bhagavad Gita was first translated into, into English exactly at the time that they were in Jaina University, all studying together. And they all read it. We know that. And we know from many of them, many of them became Orientalists because of this. Highly influenced. So what is the influence in Hegel's dialectic that went, that sounds very like Advaita, that went on to influence um, uh, Len, Lenin and Marx and all these kind of guys? I don't know. Where is the research? So where, where is the Indian aspect of it? You know, I'd like to see an Indian discussion about this, not just a, a very poor rehash of a Western discussion that's just going nowhere. So, sorry, being Can this I, strong. Can uh, I, Professor Das? I, I'm yes, adopted Western ways of analysis and thinking without doubt and, and without blame. Of course, of course they did. But um, are there other ways of thinking about it? And I would say yes. So I, I think, you know, the difficulty with Hindutva is because there's no education uh, of Hinduism in the educational system in this country, there are no trained people to offer a, a reasoned and articulate response. So there's a vacuum. So you, you have these people defining Hinduism and there's no one to counter it. So this becomes the definition. So the Barbary Mosque incident becomes the definition in this country of what Hinduism is. So when I come here from Oxford, a center for Hindu studies, people only see the word Hindu and go, oh, uh, uh, you know, are you RSS, HSS, VHP, BJP? They don't, you know, they expect it to be some political nationalistic thing, which to me is just shocking, you know, because in the West, we, when we think of Hindu culture, we think of a very expansive culture. It's philosophy, it's religion, it's art, architecture, dance, music, it's vast. It's, it's medicine, you know, it's mathematics, and it's all connected. And I come here and it's just this little, little tiny thing that everyone's scared of. It's a very recent development and, and only became popular because of this Barbary mosque, and that, that frightened everybody. And I, we need people in the country who can stand up and give a, an, an intelligent, rational response to, to whatever comes. And, and quite frankly, young people will not take the tradition seriously until they hear that. They're not going to take the Hindutva idea seriously if they're well-educated young people and if they've been out in the world a little bit. They can't take it seriously. Nationalism of that level is not taken seriously anywhere. I understand its sentiment because the same sentiment is there in Ireland. It's a good sentiment, but that energy can be challenged to be much broader. The definitions of Hinduism need to be challenged and need to be critically analyzed and and questioned. That's the only healthy uh, society that we can live in. And if you're not allowed to challenge them and question them, I, I have no faith in that, in that system. Just this last uh, point. Um, I see Hinduism as doctrinally very open, and I, th I think pluralism is also part of that openness, and you refer to that. And I think Hinduism, Hindutva, for example, I think is not part of this openness uh, which Hinduism represents. But Hinduism is also socially rigid. And India, as the garbage capital of the world, is an example of this, uh, this social rigidity. You know, other people cleaned our, uh, our streets for us and collected the garbage. Uh, 
And uh, I think this is the challenge before us. How can this doctrinal op openness impinge on this social rigidity? Mm -hmm. so that is, I think, the ongoing challenge. Uh -huh. It is an ongoing challenge. I would question the fact that the rigidity is, is a Hindu thing. Um, I, I, think, I think it's something that has developed in Indian culture uh, independently. Um, the, the jati system is not the varnashram system, you know, what we know as casteism today. It's illegal in this country and still is practiced. So it, it has deep roots in family tradition. And I don't think that that's necessarily Hindu. You can't trace that back uh, through the Vedas. You know, it's, it, it's not sustainable. So, you know, there's an ill-informed development that needs to be challenged. And I would come back to this idea of intellectual challenge. It is the um, solution is most definitely education. The more enlightened people become about what casteism is and isn't, what it was meant to be in its original form, what it became later, and that kind of thing, that discussion has never really been had. It's just rejected out of hand because the West rejected it out of hand. And that's just a, a rejection without thought. And again, I would question that. That's never healthy. So India has to come to its own solution to its own problems. You know, and, and the solution is an internal solution because some people don't like the hierarchy and they criticize you for it. Well, who is criticizing you? A country that has a monarch, that has a, an aristocracy, that has a whole hierarchy. Everyone on the planet has a hierarchy. It's just a facet of nature. The, when I said ritu, rita, the or has a little dot under it. It's pronounced ri. That word is a philosophical concept from the Rig Veda. It means upness. It means that as part of human existence, there is hierarchy. We all look up. That's why we need to follow people who are greater than us. We're impressed by them. We need them to inspire us. We want to rise up. It's actually a philosophical idea. You, you can't separate it. Two people meet in a room. One of them is superior to the other. That's just how the world works. You can't stop that. You can't legislate against it. It doesn't make any sense. So you. You, un you understand it, you accept it. You go to America, the land of opportunity, if you have money and if you're not black. That, that's inequality, it's just basic. It's, caste, it's another caste system. We, un we understand that. So have a discussion about it, have a national debate, have a local debate, have a family debate. You know, begin talking about these things, but be informed. You know, don't just make it some socio-political thing. Understand the texts. You know, the, the idea of, of by birth or by quality, that discussion is happening already in the Mahabharata. That discussion is already happening in the Upanishads. People are already having that discussion and coming up with very interesting solutions that I don't hear reflected today. So I think in, we have to discover what Hindu culture is. It's, it's very sophisticated, I, I find. You know, the things that are discussed thousands of years ago are issues that are on the table today internationally, globally. And it, they shed light on it. And it's not a religious thing. This is much more profound than that. The religious aspect, uh, ritualistic aspect, that is just a, a sideshow. For most Sampradayas would already say that. That's, that's not the essence for them. It's important to bring people together, keep people off the streets, focus their attention. It's wonderful as a celebration. But it's not the issue. Without doubt. Malvika? Can everyone agree that this is the last question? Okay. There's a microphone coming your way. At least some of the thoughts in uh, Western system are not totally different from Indian system. Just look at Ten Commandments. Look at? Ten Commandments. Mm. At least five of them are taken directly from Upanishads. I wrote these Ten Commandments on the wall to show my eight-year-old grandson and wrote another stanza, which was a translation of an Upanishad. Say, for example, Ishavasi Upanishad. He said, Tata, they look almost similar. Then my daughter brought one wall hanger, family rules. They were all there. 
Mm-hmm. All that was there in Ten Commandments, all that was there in the stanza that I wrote from Canada, which my grandson said there is a lot of similarity when I explained to him. In the family rules was a combination of all these things. That's how I taught my grandson. Yep. Um, well, two things. One is I apologize if I have come across as a belittler of Western religion or philosophy because I, I don't think like that. I'm just trying to compare a little bit. I'm, I suppose I'm trying to uh, overcompensate for Indian thought that I, I just find I'm just so surprised that so many Indians don't even realize what it is. Um, but I don't mean to belittle any tradition, and that wouldn't be consistent with Rita or Atma. Um, the other thing is an admission. The fact is I became a Hindu to become a Christian. So I don't have any problem with Christianity. I see the similarities. The, the truth is truth. Reality is reality. Sat is sat. No matter where you find it. The fact is, I found the best expression of Christianity for me in the Hindu tradition. So I got involved in a Hindu tradition because that was the thing of integrity that I could do. And the, the name wasn't the biggest issue. Uh, obviously, it causes problems in families, and the family tradition has been Christian, and we fought for this, and all of a sudden he goes off. But they fought for freedom. They fought for the freedom for me to go off and do what I thought was the best thing to do. And I took that freedom. And that's what democracy is. That's what Atma is. That's what Ritta is. And we have to have that kind of courage. So if you find the best expression, if you find the best expression in Christianity, be a Christian. That, that is the Hindu way of thinking. That's exactly how it works. To, to be a Hindu or a Christian or a Muslim is not the idea. Are you practicing it? Are you taking it seriously? Is it from your heart? Because then you will be a good person. And then you're making a contribution to the greater whole. And that's valuable. If I meet a good Muslim, and a person that actually has good character, and actually has a spiritual concept, I'm impressed. He's my brother. I can, I can relate to him better than I can relate to someone who comes to my temple just to, for a BMW. That's what uh, Gandhiji said. I'm a staunch Hindu, but I love all others. That's why he became Gandhi. I, That's why people love him. I, I, I wish I loved others. <laughs> I don't love all others, unfortunately, but I'm, I'm trying to get there. So, uh, I think with that? Uh, last question. Uh, there's a recent book by uh, Professor Wendy Doninger of Chicago University yes. called The Alternative View of Hinduism. Yes, she's a good friend of mine. Uh, and uh, so be careful. <laughs> lot said to be a lot to be said on that. Uh, I'd like your comments on that. Uh, Wendy Joniger is is uh, you know uh, for anyone who doesn't know she's a professor in Chicago University. She's an extremely good writer, a fantastic scholar and researcher, and uh, she comes out with um, the most interesting and provocative uh, challenges to Hinduism. Um, she likes to view Hinduism maybe from a Freudian perspective. Uh, which comes up with interesting results, shall we say. Um, but the thing is, my challenge back to you, I mean, she's a wonderful person, and she's not a Hindu, and she's a scholar, and she uses her scholarly expertise to examine and critically analyze, as she should, as everyone should. And everyone can have their opinion and is entitled to it. That's very much the Indian perspective, very much the pluralist perspective. If anyone has a problem with that, if they think that all these books, because her, her alternative view of Hinduism is that thick. I mean, it's a big book, and it's well written and well argued. So if you have, an, if you have a response, write a book. Become a scholar. Write a book. <laughs> that's, that's my response. We, I, as I say, we can whinge about this till the cows come home or till Krishna comes home with the cows. But the fact is, what are we doing about it? Just standing by saying, oh, another book? Oh, no, it makes us look so stupid. Stand up and write a better book. That, that's all we can do. That, that's the only way to respond to these things. Uh, Rahul no, Balotra no, has written three books now, Breaking India, Being Different, and Invading the Sacred. That yes. somehow answers that. Somehow answers. But you need someone, quite frankly, you need someone on the level of Wendy Doniger to defeat Wendy Doniger if that's what you want to do. And if you want to respond to her effectively, you need someone at that level of academic competence and research capacity. And if you don't, you won't get a proper response. Anyone can do any response in Malayalam and Tamil and Bengali, and nobody's going to read it, I can guarantee you. 
unless it comes from Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard or Yale, no one's going to take it seriously. So Hinduism has to get onto the world stage. You have to become a player on the world stage. Uh, invest in education. That's what I'm. That's my message. Everywhere and and anywhere, you know. But make it relevant. Make it meaningful. So if you want to get on her level, you have to be on her level. You know, uh, people didn't want to fight with Dronacharya on the battlefield because he was a Brahmin. He wasn't on their level. It, it wasn't a good fight. They didn't have any. There's no joy in it. You have to be. You have to get equals pitted against each other. And then it becomes interesting because then it's then it's highly articulate, highly learned, very well argued, very well reasoned. That's worth listening to. They're the they're the proper arguments. So you want to defeat her or others or anything like that? Go ahead. It's a free free country. It's a free world. Always has been, in spite of whatever propaganda. That's always been the Indian idea. So if you have something to say, say it. If you want to be in a fight, arm yourself well. Understand what the other person has and be better. So, you know, Bundy Doniger is coming to Oxford as a visiting fellow next term. We welcome her with open arms. We're a center for Hindu studies. Maybe we should be saying, oh, with these kind of ideas, it disparages Hindus, we, we don't want them. No. We want every form of thought, every form of criticism, every question. Let it all come. Let's consider all this properly. Let's do the job properly. Let our students hear all of this. Let's get traditional scholars from India. Let's get critical scholars from America. And that's education. And that's what's going to make a difference. So that, that's what we do at Oxford. And, you know, get involved. Thank you very much.